We'll also be talking about the new payroll function that we've added to EFT so that you can now send your pay stubs electronically to your uh, employees as well as T4s and R1s if you have employees in the province of Quebec. And then we'll move over to the extender product, which is a fairly new addition to the ORCID Systems product portfolio, which allows you to extend the functionality of Sage 300 to basically allow you to add your own business logic, approvals, field level security, email based alerts, and other nice features that allow you to customize and tailor the Sage 300 system to meet your specific business or organizational objectives. But as I mentioned, we're gonna start with the EFT processing and then we'll work through Extender. Now, when we talk about EFT processing, what we're really saying is that there is a way for you to create electronic payments to your vendors, payments to your employees, or to do direct debits to pull money from your customer accounts electronically. And we're not changing your existing processes within Sage 300 to do that. We're simply eliminating the necessity of generating paper-based checks from employees and vendors or having to um, wait for checks to be received from your customers. So ultimately what we're talking about is the ability to simply create a file that you then upload to the bank website, which allows you to then process payments. So it would support AP payments, AR receipts, and AR refunds. And these file formats are things that are detailed by the bank or financial institution that you're working with that tell us how the data needs to be structured within the file in order for them to process it electronically. And this streamlines the process of making payments or receiving funds. It also protects you from things like identity theft and check fraud because now you're not having to deal with paper-based documentation. You're simply using electronic processing to manage these types of transactions from within Sage 300. This also, of course, would save time and money in terms of having to print, fold, and stuff checks and remittance advices into envelopes. You, of course, would avoid the cost of the envelopes themselves, the postage, as well as the labor to fold and stuff these types of documents and put them in the mail to vendors and customers. So there's tremendous time savings as well as cost savings associated with the implementation of EFT. And we actually have an ROI calculator that you can avail yourselves of that you can just by reaching out to Joan or one of your account managers at Caron Business and they'll be happy to send you a copy of that EFT ROI calculator so that you can input your own statistics on the number of checks that you're producing and the cost that you think it is for you to generate checks and make payments to your vendors as an example on a monthly basis. And most of our customers tell us that the payback on an EFT solution is less than 12 months given the time and cost savings that they have versus the cost of purchasing and implementing the EFT processing solution. Because as you'll see, it's fairly simple to do. So as I said, our goal is to create an EFT file rather than producing paper-based checks, and it's all based on some setup options that you need to incorporate within your existing Sage 300 system. So looking at this options page, you see that we have options for setting up the AR EFT, the AP EFT, which is almost identical, and then the payroll EFT as well. So for the purpose of our presentation today, we'll focus on the accounts payable configuration because it does mirror pretty much the same options that you have for AR and payroll. And we start off with this concept of allowing EFT file creation from a batch of payments or one by one, one EFT file to one payment batch. Now this um, is really just based on your own preferences and the nature of how you're producing your AP payment batches. But as I mentioned, everything that you do currently in terms of setting up AP invoices and creating a payment batch is not going to change. It's just a question of now not having to print paper-based checks. The next option is allowing unposted batches to be selected. 
and there's a yes or no option here as well. Now, best practices would suggest that you want to say no to this option because as you're probably aware, if you make any changes to an unposted payment batch, those changes would not be recorded unless you've got some additional audit tool tracking those changes in the system, which by the way, is something you can set up within ORCID Extender that we'll be talking about in a few minutes. But there were some customers that asked us to open up the option of allowing unposted batches to be part of EFT files. So we've given people that option, but generally speaking, most of our customers should say no to allowing unposted batches. The next setting is whether or not we want to isolate our EFT vendors within one payment batch versus our non-EFT vendors in a separate payment batch. And if that's the case, then we would want to display an error and abort the creation of the EFT file if we found a non-EFT vendor in an EFT payment batch. Now, one of the ways that we can avoid that problem is by setting up our vendors using payment codes called EFT. And as a best practice, we would recommend that you do segregate your vendors between EFT and non-EFT vendors, so that when you're creating an EFT vendor, you want to use a payment code that identifies that this is an EFT vendor. And then depending on how you generate your payment transactions, if you use the create payment batch as the way of generating your AP payments. You know that on the criteria page, you can specify a payment code as one of the ways of segregating your vendors. So by using the EFT payment code and generating create payment batch this way, you can isolate your EFT vendors and make sure that just EFT vendors are part of those payment batches. So again, that would be the best practice as opposed to you having to uh, skip over the non-EFT vendors as part of one payment batch because it doesn't really save you any time or effort by having all your vendors in one payment batch because you still need to process that payment batch twice. Once to create the EFT file for EFT vendors and second time to produce paper-based checks for your non-EFT vendors. So best practices would be to split those batches and in fact, what we would also recommend is that within bank services, you create a separate unique series of payment or document numbers for EFT versus non-EFT. So you can specify that in your bank setup. If you're not clear on that, then I'd recommend you speak with Caron Business about how you can create a unique series of payment or document numbers for EFT transactions. The next option is allow selective payments from an AP batch. So we talked about the fact that you could have a range of batches within your um, EFT file. And if I say yes to that, then I may want to then be more selective about the individual payments that I want to see within an EFT transaction file. So if I say yes to that, and I want to then generate the EFT file, when I come to look at all of the batches that are available to me, I want to be able to specify entries in a batch or entries that I select. So by saying yes to selective entries, it opens up the possibility of going in and selecting just the transactions that I would like to see as part of that EFT file. So if I just want to flag one particular payment, let's say it was an emergency payment we wanted to send right away, rather than waiting until weekend or the period and I can come in here quickly and generate a quick one-off payment to a vendor by selecting just that one payment. So this gives you some more flexibility and of course once you've generated the payment for that vendor it's recorded as a paid transaction you cannot pay it twice. So just as the controls are in place for regular check payments the same controls are in place by flagging the transaction as paid within the SAGE 300 database. Now notice that in terms of the reference field, we can also include things like the check number or the invoice number or reference information from the vendor master file. So you do have also other information options that you can embed as part of the EFT file. And then lastly, coming back to the EAP options, just want to highlight a couple of more things here. One is allowing multiple vendor bank account details. 
So what this means is that if your vendor has more than one account that they accept payment from you, then you can turn that switch on and you'll be able to identify for each EFT vendor um, more than one bank account that you could potentially make payment to. And then based on the file type, the system will know which account you're referring to when you're making payment to that vendor. Now, in order to make these EFT payments, the vendor has to be active. We give you some default vendor statuses such as entered so that you can record an EFT vendor in the system. But until you're ready to actually start making these electronic payments, they might stay as entered or even inactive. So once they've been switched over to active, then you can start making payments. And of course, you know, EFT transactions are negotiated transactions with your vendors or your customers. So you have to have the appropriate permissions and paperwork in place and filed with the bank before you can start making these payments. Notice as well that in the last few versions since 2014, we've also included encryption. And encryption encrypts the financial institution number, transit number, and account number, as well as vendor details. So this also works for our employee payment remittances so that confidential information about employees' bank can also be encrypted as part of the EFT file. Now, the main part of the setup when we talk about vendors is the file type, as we've mentioned, but also the email address that we want to send the communication to. So as we're setting up our vendors, we will have a delivery method option to say, I either want to use the EFT email set up here within EFT, or I can specify the AP vendor delivery method. If I specify the AP vendor delivery method, then the system's going to come back to what I've set up in accounts payable against the vendor, and it will look at the delivery method here. If I say email under AP vendor, it's going to pick up the email address that's on the address page. And if I say contacts email, it will pick up the email from the contact page. So you have flexibility as to whether you wish to use the email address that's here in AP vendors or whether it's here in EFT vendors. So you have those choices available to you. And then of course you will document the other bank information for these vendors. In terms of configuring the system and populating the database, there is an import feature. So if you're currently using Sage Direct EFT or some other EFT system, you will be able to import these vendors into the system. But if you're just using AP and, and wanting to use EFT for the first time, we have access to the entire AP vendor list within accounts payable, and you'll be able to pick up the vendor information and then add the bank details as appropriate. What you're seeing here on the right-hand side is not part of the EFT module. This is ORCID's document management link solution. Caron will be hosting a separate webinar on the document management link and notes products from ORCID systems. I believe it's uh, later in June, around the 20th. And uh, Nancy from our team will be talking about that product and how you can attach documents with transactions and master files to support the entries that you're putting into the system. So that is the main setup options with respect to AP vendors. And now let's take a quick look at some of the other options. I mentioned the email messages. So when we look at emails, rather than printing off a remittance advice and payment information, we can act, actually send an email and identify an attachment for the remittance advice that goes with the email to your vendors based on the email address that you've specified for them. And the email message template allows us to define the body of the email the information we'd like to put in there. Notice that there's a number of variables here for document information, payment date, payment amount, contact details. All of these things can be embedded as variables. So as you're producing these emails, they will automatically generate to the appropriate customer or vendor information or employee information and attach the document with the transaction. And when we set up these emails, what we're doing is we're sending them directly to your email server. 
In most cases, that would be an Exchange server, but we also support Gmail and other email options. It also supports Office 365. So if you're using Microsoft Office in the cloud, we support integration to the cloud-based email service as well. Notice that you can put in a CC or BCC so that you can include information that's going out to your vendors and customers to a private internal email box to verify what's being sent out to your customers and vendors. And then this means that I don't have to enter or authenticate each individual email address. I'm going directly to the server so I can send a batch of emails out to my customers and vendors. And this is another nice way to streamline the process, keep it all electronic, and avoid the cost of mailing, stuffing, and folding remittance advices. So just as we do that with AP, we do that with AR, and we can also do that for payroll, direct deposit, notifications, and remittance advices. You can specify default advice templates for your AP remittances, your payroll remittances, as well as your AR refund and AR direct debit. So you can have separate uh, different advice forms within Crystal. So when we generate these transactions and we're ready to produce the form, we go to the reports page and we can print advices. So you can still print to the printer if you wanted to by choosing a print destination, which is what I'm going to choose to show you what the form looks like. But if you want to email, then the delivery method should point to the vendor customer, which then gives us the option of choosing the email template message we'd want to use and the ability to attach the remittance advice to that email. For our purposes, I'm going to show you what the form looks like. These are all standard crystal forms, so there's no magic here. It's just like any other form or report within Sage 300. And if you don't like the way we've created the standard forms, you can, of course, change that to include any other information that you'd like. But basically, for an EFT payment remittance, we've put in the vendor name and address details, their bank information, account information, as well as payment reference and payment date information, invoice number, invoice amount. So this is the kind of information you'll see. You notice that the encryption for the account number has been applied to this particular vendor, so it's blocking out through the X's on the remittance advice for payment purposes. The same would be true if we were generating payroll advices for our uh, employees. So if I print a copy to the screen, you'll see that it looks very similar to the AP remittance advice, but it's got some additional information for the employee banks. And it's just identifying the branch code and the account number, again, highlighting the encryption that's possible, along with the amounts that have been paid. And in this case, it's also demonstrating that for employee payments, we can split those payments on a percentage basis between more than one account if that's required in the setup of the system because of something our employee wants us to do. So those are the remittance advices and um, the options that we have to include email attachments. And the same information would be set up if we were setting up EFT customers. So I'll just show you very quickly that it's the same type of information we're setting up for our customers. And then for our employees, if we're doing employee EFT payments, we'll be able to specify the allocation of the banks where we're splitting payments between more than one bank. So you see that we have the percentage or allocation amount where we can do a percentage or fixed amount, choose the bank, and again, highlight the fact that the financial institution number and account number is encrypted along with the employee name and number information. So it safeguards the information within the system. But because this is an, an SDK or software development kit based module, we also have the security that is part of the security groups under administrative services within Sage 300. So EFT processing much like many of the other ORCID modules like inter-entity transactions, bin tracking, and process scheduler, and the extender module that we'll be talking about in a few minutes, all support standard SAGE 300 functionality. So when it comes to designing the system, because of the sensitive nature of EFT transactions, 
we allow you to set up some security options based on whether you want people to be able to just see or generate AR or AP or employee payroll transactions through EFT, whether they can view or edit information about the vendor or customer EFT details, whether they can set up emails, whether they can approve or view uh, encrypted information about those customers, vendors, and employees. And notice that we have a number of logs that we're going to talk about in a few minutes where we're keeping track of every time a transaction is generated or every time a new record has been added or modified within the system. So we protect things like editing vendor EFT details or amending receipts. All of this can be configured to protect who does what within the system. And generally speaking, as a best practice, if you can segregate the duties of setting up EFT vendors for, from the different from the person who's actually making payments to the vendors, or even better, if the person who creates the AP payment batch is not the same person who creates the EFT file and or is the person who uploads the EFT file to the bank, that would be an ideal scenario where you provide additional security based on segregation of duties. But one other step that you can incorporate to secure these transactions is more of an environmental control. And what we recommend here is that you generate the transfer details report, which highlights all of the transactions that have been generated in an EFT file. So this will give you the date of the run, the time and date, uh, the payment batch information, the bank that you wanted to make these payments from, the total of the transactions, and then different vendors that were made payments and the fact that they were successfully processed. And again, the account numbers are encrypted. So the transfer details information is one report based on the EFT file that was sent to the bank. So as an environmental control, what you'd want to do is compare the transfer details report with the report that you get back from the bank and then also tie that into the payment journal from accounts payable based on the payment batch or batches that you created originally for payment via EFT. And if all three of those reports match, then you can be confident that the transactions have been properly processed with no changes or exceptions. But this leads us to the discussion around the setup of the banks and the file type or the formats. Because while some people are a little concerned about the fact that nobody's actually looking at a paper-based check or signing their approval, you can incorporate approval processes around the payment batches using either a product we call Tyrox check approval or using the ORCID extender if you wanted to create an online approval process for either producing payments, approving invoices, or actually generating an EFT file. But in most cases, because these files are so secured at the bank level, it's very difficult to make a modification to an EFT file without the system tracking it. Because these files have to have specific characters in certain places, they have hash totals and control totals as part of the file. So it's virtually impossible to modify an EFT file without uh, the bank recognizing the change and rejecting the file. But just in case we do safeguard the information by setting up the EFT file banks and then these file types that we talk about, and this is probably the most critical part of configuring the system when you first start using EFT, is to recognize the fact that many of the banks, well, in fact, all of the banks have multiple file formats that they use to generate transactions. And just looking here at some of the Canadian banks, if we look down here, at Royal Bank as an example. Look and see how many different formats there are for all of the different Royal Bank types that you can support in the EFT processing solution. Even if you're using the standard 80 byte format, there are multiple formats. Uh, standard 152 is another type. If you're using a RBC Express, there are different formats. Notice as well, that the payment types that are supported are not just checks. We have the standard check payments, uh, but we also have IAT or International Automated Transfer Rules for cross-border payments. So we can make payments to vendors in Canada or in the US, 
or any other jurisdiction around the world that we support. We also support wire payments. So you can see there's a Canada TD Bank wire. There's also positive pay where I'm still producing paper-based checks, but I want to be able to send the file to the bank to verify with them the checks that we've produced. So check payments, positive pay, wires. We also support PayPal. We have different formats for PayPal. We have formats for credit card transactions and pre-notes in the United States. So any type of third-party funds transfer or any transaction that the bank will support, they generally have what's called a specification. And what we need is a copy of that specification to ensure that we have a compatible file format so that you can deploy EFT within your organization. And if we don't have it, then we're happy to create a new file format at no charge, assuming you're running a current version of Sage 300, which today would be version 2016, 17, or 18. But as you can see, because we have formats from all around the world, we can support payments to any bank or financial institution anywhere in the world. And as I say, we're always constantly adding new file formats for different banks based on the requirements of our customers. All right, so I want to just verify with you that when I talked about credit card, we're not talking about being a payment gateway. That's not what we're doing here. We're not authorizing the payment. We're just simply importing the credit card transactions that have been approved and allowing you to process them electronically rather than being forced to enter those manually. So that's what we mean by credit card payments. We're not actually a payment gateway with a merchant account that's authorizing these payments, because in this case, we're keeping track of the payment details, which is not be PCI compliant. Uh, but every other type of transaction, of course, is supported, and uh, other than the actual authorization of the credit card payment. So that basically sums up what we wanted to talk about in terms of EFT processing for transactions. What I want to do now is just review the logs that we talked about to highlight again some additional security options that we have built into the system. So when we talk about EFT logs, what we're referring to here is that every time we create an EFT file, we're applying a unique EFT file creation number. So there's always going to be a test for completeness within the system and, and adding to the EFT file creation numbers. Again, we'll have a date and a timestamp. We'll let you know what kind of a transaction it was, whether it was an AP payment, an AR refund, maybe an AR receipt for direct debits, or an employee payroll run. We'll tell you the user within Sage 300 who generated that file against the bank, and then where that file is stored. So the path to the file is actually pointing to a folder somewhere on the network. So as you're generating EFT files, it will be creating a flat file that's stored somewhere on the network. And then, as we said, you might want someone else to be uploading this file into the bank website so that, that it's properly processed on a timely basis. And then we will record the total value of the transactions within the file so that you understand what you're expecting the bank to be pulling from your account if you're making payments. Now we also have a log for payroll transactions, and then we also have a, an audit log here for every time that we add new vendors, new customers, or new employees. So again, we date and timestamp the record. We let you know the user within Sage 300 who set up the customer, vendor, or employee, and we list all of the new values for new records that have been included in the system. And again, you notice the encryption on the account information. If anything is modified, then you'll see a record for the old value and the new value that was recorded in the system. So there's a log of any changes to vendor, customer, or employee information. So it's another way that we safeguard the integrity of the data within the EFT processing area. Now, what you'll see when we get to extender in a few minutes is that we also have logs there that keep track of master file and transaction changes within the system. And lastly, before we finish up with EFT processing, I want to highlight something uh, to um, identify that in some cases, people have used our EFT system and not actually generated EFT transactions. 
And that's because we have this feature called Create Receipt Batch. And what is Create Receipt Batch? It's the ability for you to go in and define some criteria for how you want the system to automatically generate an AR receipt batch against outstanding invoices. So whether you use that receipt batch to actually create a direct debit file for EFT purposes would be up to you. But we have some clients who don't actually generate the direct debit file, but they, because they have so many recurring AR invoices, in some cases it's subscription invoices that they're generating on a monthly basis. It might be tuition fees that they're generating monthly or rent invoices. And because they've got so many invoices creating uh, AR invoices every month, and they know that the payments are gonna be coming in on a regular basis as well, they can generate the receipt batch and apply these receipts to the invoices that are outstanding within accounts receivable. So this saves a tremendous amount of time for some of these organizations who may have a couple hundred invoices every month that they need to be able to create the receipts for. So rather than manually going in and creating a receipt batch and applying it to invoices, this streamlines the entire process for them by auto-creating the receipt batch based on predefined criteria, the documents that they wish to include, and any customers that they wish to exclude from the uh, receipt generation process. So just thought I'd throw that in. It's a nice little bonus feature within EFT for those people that have to generate a number of receipts against recurring AR invoices. So that's it for the EFT processing. As I mentioned, uh, you can get additional information, pricing information from Caron Business, and they would be more than happy to answer those questions or provide additional product information and pricing. So let's move on to Extender. Now, Extender is one of those solutions that's hard to describe in one sense because it's not a traditional accounting module. It's not something that you use to um, create special accounting transactions. But what it does do is it creates the opportunity for you to automate and streamline any process within Sage 300 to create some additional security through logging and workflow approvals. And it also allows you to create collaboration opportunities within Sage 300 by sharing information, logging changes, or creating notes. So in order to understand some of the options, again, ORCID is big on using email as a communication device within Sage 300. So you'll always have the option to create email so that you can send emails automatically based on changes happening within Sage 300. So like we saw with EFT, you can send an email for payment remittances or employee direct deposit. But now you could use email internally to let someone know that something has just happened in Sage 300 if you want to do that. You can also log when users are signing in so you know how often people are logging into the system. But as we move into the functionality, here's some of the things that you can configure Extender to do within Sage 300. You can have it log changes. So every time somebody inserts a new record, updates an existing record, or does a combination of inserting and updating, you can log these changes so you have a complete audit trail of all the changes to uh, important information that's stored within Sage 300. You can also have a process that starts in Sage 300 but can automatically run a separate program that's outside of Sage 300. So let's say you wanted to generate a GL trial balance and then automatically export the data to an Excel spreadsheet for further analysis. You could automatically run a program when you update the budget information within Sage 300, and the system would know once that's done to run a program to export the data into Excel. We talked about the email alerts. So yes, we would send an email, and then we would choose the um, email template with the message that we want to send to somebody in the company. So in this case, we're looking at the fact that a customer credit limit has changed. So what we could do is set up an alert that says anytime somebody changes a customer credit limit in accounts receivable, we want to send an email to the controller and identify who did that and uh, the date it was done with the time and what the original amount was 
and what it was changed to in terms of their credit limit. And that's something that you can specify for any change to any master file or any transaction process within SAGE 300. And lastly, we may want to create a note. And then we could use a note template to do the same thing and say, I want to record as a note the fact that the customer credit limit has changed. So the next time I go in and look at that customer record, it will tell me that I've made a change and this is how recently the credit limit changed for that customer. So we're gonna show that as our example this morning. And then lastly, we're gonna talk about the scripts. Now this is where life gets really exciting because within Sage 300 now, you have the ability to customize how Sage 300 behaves without writing custom code. And the way that's done is through the adoption of a script. And what a script does is it tells the system, this is the kind of control I wanna to add to accounts receivable. So sticking with the customer credit limit, I can tell the system that rather than hiding a field or a screen from a user, I still want them to be able to see the information on the screen and they can even access the field, but I'm gonna put a limit on what a, what a valid entry is into that field. So for example, we could limit the customer credit limit entry to 10,000 as a regular user or 20,000 as a management user. And if the en person entering the data wants to try to get funny and do something different, the system will stop them because it will make the customer credit limit read only instead of being able to make changes. Now, we've seen people use this kind of process in a multitude of ways within Sage 300. For example, if you've got a large order entry sales order desk, we have a large client that has 35 people entering sales orders every day into um, Sage 300. And rather than having to visit every field, as soon as they enter the customer and the item, it knows the salesperson attached to that customer and item, the sales commission, the tax that needs to be allocated and the territory code. And it auto populates that information automatically once they complete the first three fields in the order entry screen. So that, as you might imagine, saves a lot of time and avoids keying entries incorrectly into the system. And then lastly, we have custom tables, which allows you to add a table within Sage 300 that looks just like a regular Sage 300 table and allows you to put anything into the system that you want. So imagine being able to incorporate statistical information or other fields with an, with an associated screen where anything you can think of can be incorporated as part of the standard Sage 300 system now, be part of the same database, be part of your crystal reports or financial statement reports. So this opens up the ability to actually create your own module and say, I'd really like to add something like a, an advanced allocation module for splitting transactions between GL accounts. Well, we could actually create a script that would allow you to do that automatically within Sage 300. So really the world is your oyster. You're able to do almost anything you can think of. It's only limited by your imagination. But bringing it back to something that's practical, let's take a quick look at AR customers and look at our customers. And let's talk about that customer credit limit uh, situation we were just referring to. So you can see here that for this customer 1100, I've got my uh, information here, which is a note. Now, as I mentioned, there'll be another presentation later in June that talks about the document management link and the ORCID notes. So this is a little bit of a preview for anyone that might be interested in that presentation. You can see here that the note tells me that customer 1100 Bargain Mart San Diego, which is this customer, had a credit limit change from 18,000 to 20,000. The change was done by the admin user, which is me, to update the customer record. And that change was done on May the 17th at 4.26 p.m. Now, if I go to the processing page, indeed, I will see that the credit limit is 20,000. So I know that was changed about a month ago or three weeks ago. And I come in 
and say, gee, I'd really like to give this customer a bigger credit limit. I know it just bumped from 18 to 20, but I'm trying to sell as much as I can to them. I need a higher credit limit. I'd like to bump that, let's say, to 28,000. And when I tab through the field, there's an error message that pops up because the script is now running behind the scenes and it's monitoring the entry into that field because I attached the script to that field. And it says the maximum credit limit allowed is 20,000. So I'm not able to change that. And you see, I've entered 28, but as soon as I close the error window, it pushes it back to the 20,000 that was there previously. So dejectedly, I figure, well, if that's the case, then I'm just gonna bump them down to 12,000 and we'll try to create a sec separate customer record, maybe sell to a different branch. And if I save, it's going to allow me to save the change to 12,000 from 18,000. And it would have sent an email to someone saying, so-and-so has just changed the credit limit for this customer to 12,000 from 18,000. And if I refresh the screen, and go back, you'll see that now the note has been updated. The credit limit changed from 20,000 to 12,000, done by the admin user, this time on June the 6th at 1.43 Eastern time. So it's created a note and populated that against this customer record. But I also told the system that I wanted it to log the change. So if I come to the inquiry, you'll see that when I open the inquiry, it's got the fact that it changed from 18 to 20,000 in May, and now it's just changed from 20,000 to 12,000. And the field was credit limit for customer 1100 done by the admin user against that screen in Sage 300 on June the 6th at 1.43 Eastern. And I could go back and uh, look at a whole bunch of different entries that might've been recorded over time to see all of the changes that were made. And then I could filter, of course, by the field name or the user or the key and say, I'm only interested in seeing changes to customer 1100 and filter it that way. So that's the inquiry. And of course, I could run a report if I wanted to, to show the log of changes. So that's a very simple example of how we could create notes, log the changes, send an email alert for the change that was made, and that's all incorporated within the extender module. And as I mentioned, we can create scripts against anything within Sage 300, including any third-party product that's written in the SDK. And on the ORCID website, I believe there's about 35, 36 different examples of scripts that have already been written for other customers. We have hundreds of people now automating processes in Sage 300. We have people adding new functionality. So imagine now you've got Big Brother watching over Sage 300, making sure that when something happens over here, something automatically happens somewhere else in Sage 300, or you're getting notification that these things are going on. A very popular application of Extender is, as I'm producing a purchase order, and I want to record that, I automatically generate the PO document and send it by email to the vendor. Or when I receive payment, I get notification that payment has arrived and I automatically release shipment of goods in order entry. So these things are happening now because of what Extender gives Sage 300 users the opportunity to incorporate. Actually automating processes so that you don't have to remember, the system will automatically know if this happens, go ahead and process this. So it really does create some exciting opportunities to streamline processes, to save time, but also to create additional security options through field level security, or just making sure that things are getting done on a timely basis and there's no lags in the system. So we invite you to consider the possibilities of Extender and again, I would recommend you speak with someone at Caron Business to talk to them about ways that you might be able to use this module to make Sage 300 work smarter and better for you in your organization.